Good morning. Welcome to church. It's so interesting what's been happening these past months. My neighbor was just telling me, wow, time passed so fast. It's already been three months. And how are all of you? That's what we ask one another whenever we get a chance to meet with each other or even WhatsApp each other after a long time. How are you doing? What's been happening with you? So before we continue today's sermon, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have prepared our hearts for what's been happening. Father, we thank you that nothing comes as a surprise to you because you are always in control. Father, we ask even as um, today's sermon that Holy Spirit, you would be our teacher. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our understanding. Let us be sensitive to your word and to what you want of us. Father, we ask for courage, courage to respond to you, courage to take action upon your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been very interesting because for the past um, two years, people whom I know about have passed on, like Billy Graham. Billy Graham died in 2018 at the age of 99. He's an American evangelist. Then we have Reinhard Bonnke, who died in 2019. He was a German evangelist and missionary in Africa since 1967, before some of you were even born. We have Ravi Zacharias, who just passed away in May. He was an Indian-born Canadian-American apologist who came to know the Lord because he failed in a suicide attempt when he was 17 years old. We have David Pawson, who died in 2020, just a few days after Ravi died. He was an English Bible teacher and writer. When I, I was in my early 20s, I remember renting cassettes of Bible teaching by David Pawson from a local Christian bookstore. These people have been in ministry for more than 50 years of their lives, longer than some of us have even lived. Psalm 116 verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. And what all of these have told me is that there is a changing of the God. We are a generation that will see the coming of Jesus. When you read the Bible and you say that, you know, when, when Christ comes again to Jerusalem, the whole world will know. Years before, we used to wonder, how will the rest of the world know what's happening in Jerusalem? I remember during the earthquake and what happened in Japan when the nuclear reactors were cracked. I remember seeing videos on Facebook that people took life of the tsunami that was happening and the floods that, that happened in Japan. Live. And if that can happen for a natural phenomena, you can be very sure when Christ comes again, you and I will definitely know. And I just want to remind you all, we are at a time that's going to be exciting, depending on how you look at it. If you know what's going to happen, it's exciting because you know that it is a fulfillment of things that has already been stated. But if you are blur and you don't know what's happening, it can be a time of fear, a time of worry, a time of anxiety. And so I want to encourage you all, be in the loop. Know what's happening. Why did these people give 50 years of their life to a ministry? Some went to places they didn't, uh, they were not born in. Why? Because we all believe in what Jesus said, that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. We also believe that in Hebrews 9.22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, in times past, sacrifices were always made 
even people who of other religions have understood this concept that sacrifices are to be made to please the gods. So in the past, people believe an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. In Exodus 12, when it tells about God giving the instruction to Moses about marking the Passover, God told him, this is the beginning of your year. The beginning of the Jewish calendar year starts off with the Passover. God gave instruction that a lamb, either a sheep or a goat, which was without defect, was to be killed and slaughtered. And the blood of it was to be taken and to be put on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses. Now, if you believe what God says, if you believe what Moses says, then you will do as what was instructed. But if you think, what is this? And if you choose not to do it, then you will have to reap the repercussions of it. The Word of God says, this law is a shadow of the good things which is to come. Which means the instruction that they had about the Passover that long ago was to be a shadow of what Jesus would be doing. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So that once and for all, there doesn't need to be another sacrifice for the sins of men. Because we believe this, we live a life that reflects what we believe. Because these people believed it, they gave their life to the ministry, more than 50 years of their life, to preach the gospel, to share with you why they believe what they believe. And because of all this, I want to share five letters with you. The first one, let us draw near. Hebrews 10.19 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, verse 22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us have the confidence. Let us draw near to God. What does draw near mean? Draw near is like old English. Okay, new English. Let us get close. Let us come nearer to God. Let us come to Him with confidence. Why? Because Jesus has finished the work. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice once and for all. And because of Jesus, we can have a clear conscience. That's why I've just put these three words. If you can't remember the whole verse and everything, remember these three words. Let us get close to God. Let us get close to God with confidence. Let us get close to God with a clear conscience. The second let us. Let us hold on to. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For God who promised is faithful. Hold fast to your confession. Persevere in your faith. Do not swerve. Do not give up. Do not shake. Do not doubt. Be steadfast. Remember the hope that we profess. And continue to profess. Continue to declare. Let us hold on to the confession of our faith. And the third, let us. Let us consider how to. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, in olden times, of course, meeting together means going to one another's houses and sharing a meal together and having fellowship. And for the past three months, that has been challenged. 
but also I've heard of good news of how families meet together, how they call relatives or, or people of another generation which whom they do not even meet. Maybe once a year, Chinese New Year or Christmas, or they have not seen each other for years. How they've gotten in touch with their relatives who are younger and had Zoom meetings of, you know, like 20 people together, cousins coming together. It's been very interesting. And so instead of reacting to what we cannot do, many people have also gone through things, what we can do, learning new things, learning how to use Zoom meetings, uh, WhatsApp video calls, so many new platforms and so many new applications to help each other manage these uh, restrictions about coming to meet together. And what's encouraging that we don't only meet together the people who are near to us physically, geographically, but people from across the world. People who are seven hours, eight hours time difference. Yet, we can still meet because of the present situation. So let us consider how to spur one another, how to stir up one another towards love and towards good deeds. Just to recap, number one, let us draw near to God. Number two, let us hold fast to the hope that we profess. Three, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. When we say draw near to God, God is already there. It is we who moves closer to Him. We draw near to Him. When we say, let us hold on to the confession of our faith, it is already there. What is it that we share? The details are there. We have to do it. We have to hold on. We have to declare this hope that we have. And let us consider how to stir one another towards love and good deeds. Because we have God in our hearts, we have a desire to love. We have a desire to share. We have a desire to bless one another. So let us consider how to stir up one another. Some of you have been having cell group meetings using the internet. And um, some of us are in a generation where we are challenged how to do all these things. Like when I teach online at home and, and things don't happen, I just thankfully have a son to call out to and say, <gasps> Something's not happening. It's not functioning. Help! And I thank God for people who can help me. So how do we stir up one another to love and to good works? Hebrews 10.36 says, Persevere. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. So remember, let's stir up one another not in a negative way, but in a positive way. Stir up one another to love, to good deeds. And when we think of meeting up, it does not necessarily have to be physically or yam cha or things like that, but in other ways as well. Someone told me, I'm a bit antisocial. So it's very easy during these times of restriction to just not contact people and just be introvert and just carry on with what I need to do every day. There is that danger there. And that is why there are many groups who are online and telling people how to take care of their mental health. That one of the things you need to do is to remain connected. Talk to somebody. Share with somebody. More important, let's stir up one another to love and to good deeds. Hebrews 11 is a famous chapter on faith. Now what is faith? Faith 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, 
the assurance of the things we do not see. When my husband wanted to go into university, he didn't get what he wanted. He thought that because of financial constraints, it would be best if he could study where he, he was living in Petaling Jaya. But he did not get what he wanted. He was sent to Singapore and to accountancy, which wasn't something he wanted. And it was a very trying time for him because he believed in his heart that he would do medicine, but it wasn't what he wanted. And, and he humbled himself and he told himself, God, maybe I was stubborn for so many years of my life. Maybe this is not what I'm supposed to do. And he tried. He tried accountancy. And uh, God blessed him with a senior that gave him all the books he didn't have to buy and things like that. And people were telling him, you see, that's where God wants you to be. God's helping you with all these things. And yet it was in his heart. And this was the verse that made him hold on. Faith is the confidence what we hope for. The assurance of things we do not see. When you believe that God created heaven and the earth, when you believe that God spoke and the world came to being, that means God created, He made something out of nothing. That requires faith. In Hebrews 11, we have examples of Abel, of Enoch, of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. It says that faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God because if we come to Him, we must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, Noah was asked to build this big ark. At that time, there was no rain. There was no water from the sky. He was living in a place where you don't even see the sea or the ocean. But in faith, in obedience, he built the ark. That's why his neighbors and all ridiculed him and thought he was crazy. It says clearly in the word of God that Abraham set off where he didn't even know where he was going. And because he believed in God, he lived in tents, ready to move to wherever God was going to show him. Joseph lived in faith because when he was about to die, he told the people of Israel, do not leave my bones here. When you go to the land that God has promised you, bring my bones with you and bury them in that promised land. These people were commended for their faith and they did not even receive what they had seen. May I add to this long list of, of uh, giants of faith? Billy and Reinhardt and Ravi and, and David, these people gave their lives to the gospel knowing that they were going to be brought to a place, believing, living their life in faith. And we know that the church of God is built on the blood of the people who have given their lives for the gospel. Some of these people, we don't know their names. Some of these people, we cannot name because of where they stay and why they gave their lives for the gospel. Therefore, let me tell you the fourth letters. Let us throw off. Hebrews 12, 1 says, We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. These people, these men of faith, men and women of faith, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. What does throw off mean? That means don't have something that, that holds you down. It's just like if you travel, no baggage. You just walk onto the plane. When it lands, just get off. Or if you're traveling to, to a friend's house or to a relative's place, no baggage means you just get in the car, go to your destination and get off. You don't have to worry about what to bring, what not to bring. Did I remember? Did I forget? So when you throw off things that hinder you, that means you don't have any extra baggage. You don't carry anything else. Why? Because God is with you. What you need is with you. You don't need anything else in that sense. So the fourth letters, let us throw off. What hinders you? 
What robs your time? What distracts you? What is challenging you from walking that journey of faith with the Lord? You can consider the elders in our church. How many years have they been in ministry? These people that you have spoken to. Take time to talk to them. Take time to find out why did they go into full-time ministry. Let them be an encouragement to you. I have friends, personal friends, who are in full-time ministry all over the world, in places that are dangerous, in places that are peaceful, reaching out to people who are marginally challenged, who are in danger. And these people also have been also appeared on, on hit lists sometimes. And yet these people will run that race for Jesus. So remember, Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us throw off. And it also says, let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Each and every one of us have our own race. Each one of us has our own course. We are not competing with one another. The goal is to finish the race to receive the prize at the end. Paul says that everyone who, commit, who competes in a game has to go through strict training. And we have to discipline ourselves. We have to persevere. We have to endure. I tell people that in sports and in performing arts, it is one thing to get it right, but it's only the beginning. When you get it right, it's just saying that you are at the starting mark. You repeat again and again to make sure it is always right so that it will never be wrong. If you are a sprinter and you are taught the techniques of how to run correctly. It is just the start. You have to repeat it again and again and again and go for race after race after race so that you will run even faster. I'm a music teacher. When we play something correctly, it's just the beginning. It's not like taking a test where it's uh, all right to get 80%. You don't always have to be 100%. But if I sing you a song and I had two notes which were off, you will say, okay. But it will only be good if it was 100% correct. And therefore, when we run the race, it is something that is continuous, ongoing, and requires discipline. I may run well today. If tomorrow I'm lazy, I decide to indulge in a lot of uh, junk food that I'm not supposed to, then tomorrow I'm not running so well. And if the day after I don't pick up again, then my running ability, my timing gets worse. To maintain that discipline is not easy. To persevere is not easy. To endure is not easy. You see people running when it's drizzling. It's part of the discipline because they know that if they stop today, it's difficult to get going tomorrow. And if they stop for two days, it's even more difficult to get onto it after that. It needs consistency. The same thing with our walk with the Lord. It needs consistency. I just want to share a, a short verse with you all, something that I read when I was much younger. It says, God has not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. 
God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labour, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. It doesn't mean that our lives have no hardship, have no difficulties. I was, I was sharing with someone, if you didn't have difficulty, you wouldn't be praying, would you? I asked another person, when you call me, you only call me when there is a need or you call me because you want to keep in contact with me. And she was honest and she said, mm, only when I need something. That's normal. Okay, you don't have to feel bad about it. And so God understands us that sometimes when our life is so smooth going, we don't need God because we can do everything ourselves. But when there is a challenge, when the road is slightly bumpy, when it's difficult, we know we run and turn to God. The fifth let us, let us run. Hebrews 12 verse 2 to 3 says, Fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We need a focus. When I was learning swimming, one of the things we were, we were told is that we've got to focus at a point ahead of us to make sure we swim straight and not like go diagonal across the swimming pool and bang into our friends. Same thing, let's think about running, okay? Let's say if you run short distance, 100 meters, usually you can see the finishing line. Not that difficult. If you're running 400 meters and your school field or whatever is not so small, you can sort of like uh, know where is the finishing line. What happens when you have to run a longer distance? For example, 1,200 meters. You have to remember how many rounds you need to go around the track. And as I was reading this, it said that it is, you need to go around the track usually about three laps. And the third lap is a challenging one because that's when fatigue comes in and lactic acid begins to accumulate in your muscles. So the longer we need to run, the more we need to pace ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves. We need to build up our endurance because you cannot see the finishing line when you start. What more if you were to run a marathon of 42 kilometers? How far is 42 kilometers? Um, from where I stay to Kulai is about 25 kilometers only. So 42 kilometers, I definitely cannot see the end from where I start. But you will know from people who run marathons, they will tell you that they first started by aiming for 5 kilometers, then 10 kilometers, then half marathon, 21 kilometers, before they finally go to 42 kilometers. And they train all the time. I have a friend who used to run marathons. And I asked her, so how do you train? You know what she did? She said that um, she goes to her office early and she runs up and down the staircase. 16 floors. That's discipline. That's dedication. That's being focused because she knows why she's doing it and what she's doing it for. Same thing. In this race that we run, with Jesus as our focus. We need to be continually reminded what is that focus and why we are in that journey. So let us stir up one another. Let us remind one another. Let us not neglect meeting with each other. Sometimes we say life is short. It is all subjective. But as we go through day by day, we feel that Life is not that short. When we started these restrictions, 
Some people thought it was only two weeks. And where are we now, three months later? From the beginning, in March, we could not have seen what would have happened now in June. What will happen in August? What will happen in November? Not many of us will have an idea of what's happening. But in running this race, don't give up. Keep your focus on Jesus. So I just want to remind you all. One, let us draw near to God. Get close to God with a sincere heart. Have confidence because of the finished work of Jesus. Keep a clear conscience. Two, let us hold on to that hope that we profess. Because Jesus is coming back. Be steadfast. Be ready to witness. Be ready to testify. Three, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good deeds. Encourage one another. Meet up with each other. Four, let us throw off that which hinders us, entangles us. Don't carry extra baggage. And five, let us run our own race. Let us run with perseverance. Let us run with endurance. Let us run with discipline. Let us run focused on Jesus. Years back, there was this tag that goes, what would Jesus do? Now they changed it. Do what Jesus did. Some of you may say that such a simple answer, are you sure it applies to everything? I would say, have you tried it? Some of us have this, this attitude that before we try something, we ask a lot of questions. There's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes, the is it asking questions because we want to clarify, we want to be better prepared, we want to um, be more aware? Or asking questions because of the seed of unbelief? If you have unbelief, nothing anybody says will change your mind because you've already closed your, your door. Anything anybody says, there will be an argument. I remember a Bible teacher said that if you want to say that black actually is white, you can find verses in the Bible to support your case. But then you would not be handling the Word of God the way it is supposed to be handled, rightly handling the Word of Truth. So in every circumstance, do what Jesus did. How did He live His life? How did He treat other people? How did He handle the doubts that His disciples had? How did he manage people with their weaknesses, with their challenges? That is how we run our race. Not being selfish, self-centered, or I don't care about other people or things like that just because it's my own race. But we know God loves people. And so I cannot live my life and ignore other people. That is not the way. So knowing that Jesus is our perfect high priest, the perfect sacrifice, we have confidence to draw near to God. Let us hold on to the confession of our faith. Let us stir up one another to love and to good deeds. Let us throw off the things that hinder us, that entangles us, 
from running this race properly. Let us focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Father, much has been said. Father, we believe that it is your Holy Spirit who teaches us, who guides us, who explains the truth to us. Father, we want to continue to grow, grow in our walk with you, grow in our dealings with one another, to be sons and daughters of the Most High God, to be light, to be salt, to be a place of refuge, to be a place of encouragement, to be a place of comfort, a place of hope. Let your words be like seeds that would grow in the garden of our hearts. Let it bear fruit for you, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold. Let our lives bear fruit and be a good harvest for you. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you.